This is track four, day two, Houston 2023. We have with us Jeff Baker, a director of Solutions Engineering. <laughs> and he has been working in cybersecurity for over 25 years, currently serves, oh, it's right there, director of Solutions Engineering at Slashnet. He is an experienced engineer aligning technology capabilities with business needs and requirements. He specializes in cloud, network, identity access, and overall computer security. Yes, please come in, track four, join us. Use my voice for good. Uh, he is passionate about leading teams and the organization to successful results. Thank you. Okay, I have to first say that came from a long time ago. Uh, I had to do a write-up for something. I think somebody copied and pasted that, but sadly I have to say I've been doing this for 33 years. You probably can tell by the color of my hair or lack thereof, but uh, I see a lot of faces out in the crowd that people have been around. Sometimes it's different conferences. Sometimes you see people in the office, a lot of new faces, but uh, yeah, I've been doing this a while. Um, back in the day, we didn't call it security. There was really no security. In fact, I started off at a company called Harris Lanier where I was fi fixing word processors. It was uh, component level repair, alignment of floppy drives, kind of the stuff, but things were not connected uh, via wire. But, you know, things have changed. But today, we have we hear a lot about ML, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, and now generative AI. And, uh, but you know, it wasn't that. I mean, back in the day, it was, uh, you leave the office, make sure you lock the, the, the closet, right? Uh, lock the doors. We didn't have to really worry about theft. And it was really not so much about identity theft or nobody really had anything to steal. It was more about, can I take down your network? But things have certainly changed. Uh, I'm gonna be talking today, let's see, this probably looks a little different than what you thought you were gonna hear. It's the exact same content, but what they sent me is uh, says this, but this is exactly what I'm here to talk about. And, and I know I'm in a room full of smart people, but I'm gonna do a little level set on, you know, these terms that have been thrown around for months and, and years, but artificial intelligence, you go to a website, everybody's got AI, everybody's got ML, but you know, really what is it? The difference between AI and generative AI is that AI is structured, it's a pattern of information, it's a set of rules that are designed to look at something and say this matches that criteria. Generative AI, on the other hand, is more of a data-driven, it's a derivative of AI, but it's more data-driven, where it, it doesn't have those limitations of supervised content, it's more on the creative side. It's more about taking the data that it has and then essentially learning from that, right? Uh, but it's been around a long time, so I'm guessing most people had never really heard of, of, of ChatGPT or OpenAI uh, back until maybe November of last year. But AI has been around a long time. In fact, I've got a video that I'm gonna show here in just a second, but there's a guy named Jeffrey Hinton who is perceived as the father of, of AI. He actually developed something in the 70s. In fact, what he sought out to do was to build a neural network to somehow replicate what the brain does. His whole thing was he wanted to understand how the brain works. So he built this neural network of machine learning software capabilities in software and it was comprised of layers. And the layers each were responsible for their own piece of the problem that they were trying to solve. And that's really what generative AI is, is, is all about. But uh, let's, let's go ahead and pause this and, and jump to a video. It's already gonna be at the three minute mark. You may have seen this in 60 Minutes, a spot with, with Scott Kelly, or I think that's his name. But uh, very, very in interesting and intuitive. And I think it only lasts about a minute. video to go with it?
for example, a robot scores, a message is sent back down through all of the layers that says that pathway was right. Likewise, when an answer is wrong, that message goes down through the network. So correct connections get stronger, wrong connections get weaker, and by trial and error, the machine teaches itself. You think these AI systems are better at learning than the human mind? I think they may be, yes. And at present, they're quite a lot smaller. So even the biggest chatbots only have about a trillion connections in them. The human brain has about a hundred trillion. And yet, in the trillion connections in the chatbot, it knows far more than you do in your hundred trillion connections, which suggests it's got a much better way of getting knowledge into those connections. So you get the idea. The, the, the vast difference between AI and generative AI is those robots that have eyes as a camera and, and motor skills as a robot were told simply the objective was to score. They were not taught how to play soccer. They were not given any kind of instructions. But when it went into the net, they knew that that was a good result and it passed through the layers and each of the layers were represented and, and it was and those become stronger and the and the misses become weaker. But this guy goes on to say that he cannot really explain how this thing works even though it was developed, right, by people. It learns on its own and it does some things that are, are really insane. But he also thinks in the next five years that these things are gonna be able to reason. Yeah. And he thinks that in that time frame somewhere in there that that humans will no longer be the most intelligent thing on the planet Earth. That's really kind of alarming. So whether you think that uh, artificial intelligence and these chatbots are a good thing or a bad thing, I think there's a little of both. I think humans as a, as a whole, we don't know what we're up against. I think we're gonna see in the end what this is gonna look like. But generative AI and chatbots are exceptional in healthcare. They are creating medicines that humans can't create. They're doing medical diagnosis better than the doctors. So there's a lot of good to it, but I think we can all agree that there, there's also a lot of nefarious um, capabilities built into that as well. Okay, and you know, again, so generative AI has been around a little bit too. It's not brand new. ChatGPT is just a, it's a UI that sits on top of what they call an LLM, a large language model. It's a whole bunch of data. And it, and it basically answers questions. If you wanted to write a 500 word essay on underwater basket weaving, it'll spit it out in seconds. And if you don't like the results of that, you can ask it to do it again. It can write code. It can do some uh, uh, pretty alarming things. But it's been around a while, about five years ago, I think we probably all have done this with our, with our cell phones, where you have this app, you take a selfie of yourself and it does age progression kind of shows you what you're gonna look like 25, 30 years down the road. That was computer vision, generative AI, that was responsible for that. Today, it's all about natural language. And these models are predicting the next word in, in the sentence, right? But it's really more and more than that. Uh, but you can imagine all of the nefarious activity that comes from that. I guess I can step through a couple of these. These are really non-meaningful slides because I've really kind of depicted what these are, but you can see in the news what these really amount to. They are already changing this. And again, uh, November, I think everybody learned about Open AI, Open AI and ChatGPT, but there's Google Bard that's out there. There's a couple of others, not new, but it's kind of legendary if you think about it. There's one in particular. Um, the middle one, AI can become the great equalizer to block phishing attacks. The, the old adage that you, can, you have to fight fire with fire, right? I would say and argue that you have to fight generative AI with generative AI. AI by itself is not enough. It can't learn from what it has, right? So you've got to pay attention. Um, the other thing is uh, the abuse of this. Um, there's a couple I'm going to show up here, some examples. You may have heard of Worm GPT. That was discovered by Slashnext, by the way. There's Fraud GPT, which is a derivative. It's a jailbroken version of Chat GPT. And now you've got 
that's about to be introduced, a derivative of Google Bard, is Google Bart and Google Bert. This guy is actually advertising that these are gonna be released, they're gonna be easier uh, for you know, these nefarious actors to leverage and use. It's, it's, it's a little bit of alarming here. The other thing I wanted to say too is, uh, if you're on the side of the house that we should just unplug this, it's too late. You can load this on a laptop and do everything that you want to do. You can create the content that you want to send somebody, whether that's malicious code, whether that's a, a business email compromise type message. You can use the likes of a SendGrid or a Twilio to send this out, and guess what? You don't have to lift a finger to do it. You don't have to be the prince of Nigeria that needs somebody that can write in English in a, in a convincing way that you're gonna receive it and respond to it. They can literally write this in their native language and then translate it and convert it and send this out. And when you don't respond today, we're gonna send you something tomorrow. But it, it, it's kind of crazy what this is, is turning out to be for bad actors. And the other thing I would say, the reason we gotta have it, you think China's gonna give up on it? You don't think for a second that they aren't using it to weaponize or, or, or to gain an advantage? But there are good uses for it. And we kind of have to figure out a, a good way to have ethical boundaries around it. What you see across the top there, these have ethical boundaries. Slash next by itself is a chatbot. We actually are using generative AI to fight this problem. We've had that for about two years. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but what's on top generally are ethical. You cannot ask these chatbots for a recipe to create a nuclear bomb. They're gonna tell you you can't do it. Now you come down here to the bottom, and they can care less. There are no ethical boundaries, right? Um, if you wanted to tell it to write malicious code, it'll do it. If you, wanted to, if you ask it to, to create undetectable malware, it'll do it. It can learn code by itself, just the same way that those robots were learning how to play soccer without instruction. But yeah, there's a, there's a dark side to this. Uh, any questions so far? Any thoughts? Anybody want to say I, I call BS on that? Right? Uh, this kind of goes back to what I was saying before is, you know, you, you can be in Asia, you can be in Venezuela, you can, you can ask it to create something and then just translate it and then start sending this stuff out. Not rocket science here. Now, a couple of examples here of Worm GPT. When we discovered this, it was found on the dark web from one of our data scientists. And the reason that we know it's real is we went out and bought our own subscription. It's 100 euros a month. And we started playing with it, we started testing it. We started using our own generative AI to, to see if we can understand what it was creating, if we can discern the difference of what was created by a human versus what was cre created by a chatbot. But it is real, it is there. And fraud GPT, as I said, is a jailbroken version of chat GPT. Does obviously some of the very same things. They talk about the ease of use, better than the others. There's a lot that goes with it. This is Dark Bird and Dark Bart. This is a guy that's made a lot of money on the dark web that has built these two that have yet to be released, but he's advertising them and he's talking about the effectiveness of them and what they're gonna allow to do. There's actually a YouTube on it. I, it's not worth going there to see. It's basically gonna scroll through. You're gonna see this chat chain of, of somebody he's communicating with and the, the, the money that's involved there and what they can get and how easy it is. But let's talk a little bit about where generative AI, when it comes to just regular business activities or where they're interfering, and how they're trying to manipulate their way into the organization is through business email compromise, which obviously comes through email. There's also business text compromise. You've seen these on your phone. They're, they're an SMS text that come in the form of a smish. They want you to go buy gift cards and send them to a, the CEO because he's at a conference, right? I actually have a customer the CEO sent out to the entire company, 10,000 employees, and said, I am never going to ask you to go buy something on my behalf. I am never going to text you, so do not respond to these. But BEC comes in many forms. Sometimes it is the executive impersonation. 
So you gotta have the ability to discern who are my high value targets, how do I protect them, and, and kind of do what I just said. Make sure that nobody receives that message. Um, but there's vendor compromise. Hey, I sent you an email, you haven't responded, it, it, it sounds convincing. Uh, and then there's the, the typical kind of the payroll fraud. Payroll fraud is bad for organizations because they have to end up paying twice. So if I can convince HR that my bank information has changed and I provide them with, with a new account number and a new routing number and they send me a check, it wouldn't be me, it would be the guy, the imposter that's uh, pretending to be me, but they're gonna have to turn around and pay twice. But BDC comes in many different forms. Here's a, a, a few of them. There are many, many, many more. But the art of this is you receive an email, you receive a message. It may not have a malicious link. It may not have a malicious file. It might not even have a phone number to call. But the tone and the intent of the message is trying to incite you to do something. Sometimes it's just a conversation starter. Hey, how are you doing? You know, whatever. And, and the bad part is, is somebody inside the organization starts responding, they start replying, and then the, the, the domain's names start to change. They start to get spoofed, where it looks like google.com, but it's actually Google with zeros instead of O's, right? So they take the real people that they're trying to hide from out of the equation, and now you're speaking directly with somebody on the, on the, the wrong side of the house. And then they're gonna convince you that email is not working for them, that we need to go to WhatsApp, or let's go to text. They're gonna make up some reason why you gotta get outside of what is otherwise protected. Now, email represents, according to the FBI, 50% of the threat landscape. That means, obviously, it's, it's how we do business. We communicate internally and externally, and it's the easiest, fastest way to get to the masses. But the bad actors know that. I call email the front door of the house. It's well fortified, it's like a bank vault. We spent millions of dollars on that. The bad actors know that, right? They're gonna pick a window, they're gonna pick the back door, they're gonna go through the chimney, they're gonna pick a crack in the mortar because they're rats. And they know that these are you know, not protected. In large part, we all know today that this is a productivity tool. I use this just as much as I use my computer. Wherever I am, it is the perimeter for me. And so is my laptop. If I'm on a plane, I'm using my laptop. If I'm at the office, I'm using it, I'm using my phone. It doesn't matter where I am, but those can be compromised. And, and what really what we're trying to solve for is anywhere a user can be messaged, corporate email, personal email, Facebook, LinkedIn, Slack, Discord, WhatsApp, you name it, it's a communication channel. And those are the threat vectors that bad actors are coming after you with. And you've got to be able to protect uh, against all of those. Let me see where I'm at here. Uh, this goes back to what they're doing now with some of these chatbots. They are literally integrating APIs, workflows. They have HR departments, technical IT departments. But this is getting crazy bad. And uh, another thing we've noticed at Slash Next is the FBI says that the primary threat vectors are links. Um, let me see if I'm saying that right. Actually, it's BEC, business email compromise. It doesn't represent a significant portion of the threat landscape, but it's highly effective. And chatbots just make it that much more difficult to discern what is good and bad. And then um, there's the smish. They say that's dangerous. It's the number two and then credential theft, which generally is gonna come in the way of a, of a link or, or something along that line. But um, it's just gotten a, a lot easier for them to do this stuff. Create the content, email the content, don't lift a finger, don't have to be the Prince of Nigeria needing resources, but it's, 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 it's alarming. And I, and I say that because the BEC thing, which is only 5%, has now grown to almost 30%. Links used to be 90%. You had to get something. You see a QR code at the restaurant, you see a QR code at the, the airport, you take a picture of it, guess what happens? You're, give, you're not just getting what they want you to see, there could be something being installed on your machine. And if it's a bad actor, he's obviously trying to infect the device and then ultimately cross over onto the corporate side. That's the end goal. But you gotta be able to protect against QR codes as well. 
I'm not going to show that. This is a kind of a slick example of you asking a question of ChatGPT and you watch in a matter of seconds of what it creates. Seconds. Perfect grammar, perfect English, perfect punctuation, the entire thing. And again, if you don't like the result, do it again. I wish I had this one back in high school and college, but it would have made things a lot easier. So I don't need to, I don't need to read these uh, to you. I think you kind of get the gist of it, but you could be a novice and steal a bunch of money. That's what generative AI has really come to. That's what these chatbots are all about. But this speaks to what I was telling you before. 50% of the threats come outside. Those are the, the three on the, over there. You see some examples here. This is not email. This is real stuff that took down real organizations that have spent a lot of money. And moreover, their brand has been tarnished. I apologize if you're in here and you represent one of these, but I feel sorry for that Cisco guy. All the security tools they have on the planet, he got owned in personal Gmail. It infected his, it got inside of the browser and then moved over inside the organization and they stole about 10,000 code base files. All right, now, now this is my little blurb on Slash Next. I've said a little bit about threats being outside of email. What we set out to solve for is anywhere a user could be messaged, they could be compromised. We already know that email is 50% of the equation. We are gonna sit behind whatever email security that you have today and augment that. Sometimes we're a replacement. But what we're gonna be looking for are natural language threats, the BECs that I just talked about. We're gonna look for link-based threats and we're gonna look for file-based threats. No different than what most people are trying to do. For us, it's the way we curate our data and the fact that we don't trust anything and therefore we verify it. Related to the BEC piece, remember I said you, you have to fight fire with fire, you have to fight generative AI with generative AI. AI by itself is not enough, it's limited. We actually, you saw it before, we have our own chatbot. And the purpose of it is you receive that email, it's got no link, it's got no file, and all it's got is this message. We're gonna examine the tone and the intent. We're gonna understand the relationship graph, right? Do we communicate back and forth at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday? Do we talk about accounts payable? Is our writing style the same? Does it look different than what I normally do, right? So there's a lot of indicators. But we're gonna take the message, and we are not gonna just rely on the organic nature of what it is and say, have we seen this before? That's not enough. We are gonna literally rewrite that message using generative AI in our chatbot into as many permutations possible. And that could represent dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of the same message using different words expressing the same tone and intent. And we take that original message and we take all of those synthetic clones and we make a runtime decision as that email arrives in the inbox as to whether or not it needs to be blocked. It has drastically increased, increased our accuracy and efficacy and the false positive rate has fallen through the floor. And it's because of the large data set. But we also take that original and those synthetic clones and we then train our models against it. It's just, I mean, you saw the robot kicking a goal. That's impossible, but it does. And using generative AI really allows us to predict what is gonna to happen tomorrow when we don't respond today. But when it comes to your mobile device, when it comes to your productivity tools, your computer and your endpoint, we are on device. And it is at the time of click on the mobile, if you tap on something malicious inside of WhatsApp or anything on your phone, if it's malicious, we're gonna block it. We're gonna provide the user with a teachable moment as to why we made the block. It was a binary decision, by the way. It was a yes or no proposition. It wasn't a scale of one to 10, where we think it's a seven, and you might wanna reconsider. No, it is in fact a fish. The other thing we do on mobile is, I've kinda mentioned it also before, is that smish that you get. We prevent those from getting in the face of the user. If it's trying to incite you to do something, or if you've listed the CEO and the CFO and the VPs of everybody that should not be sending those messages, executive impersonation protection, we are not gonna let that message get in the face of the user where they can respond to it. And on the computer, it's your last line of defense. We live in the browser as a, as a plugin. It's, it installs automatically. It's not browser isolation. It is not a Talon or an Island or a Seraphic. It's not a proxy. We're not sending it anywhere to be interrogated. You know, if, if you send something by way of a proxy and it has to analyze it, do you think your browser's gonna wait? 
No. Patient zero is going to go to that site, malicious or not. This is on device at the time of click, secondarily. If you pick up a thumb drive in the parking lot, you get some, sent something inside of Teams or Slack, or you click on something on, in your browser or a personal email, and that link has never been seen before, that lightweight plugin has machine learning built into it because it will actually let the page load because we haven't seen it either. And it's going to look under the covers. It's going to look at the browser canvas. It's going to look for those indicators of compromise. And if, it, uh, if we see one, we're going to block it. Again, a binary decision. But it is your last line of defense. I had somebody the other day say, hey, I don't think your thing's working. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Google Safe Search blocked it, but you didn't. And I sort of snickered. And I said, well, they're supposed to. Thank goodness they did this time. But we are the last line of defense. They're, they're before we are in the Congo line. Right? So if nothing else will block it, we're going to block it. And that's really it. We're at Booth 16. Um, our, our service is so easy, it's set and forget. I have literally, on a call, set up email that takes five minutes. The service that I talked about, the flow is we sit behind the seg. Microsoft throws us a web hook and says, now you can slice it. You go interrogate it, look for BBC, look for links, look for files. And we're going to cherry pick out what they missed. But that service takes five minutes to set up. It's not in line. You can do it in what we call observability mode or none. Take no action. Just show me everything that's getting through. And then the browser and the mobile. But I've done email, browser, and mobile in 18 minutes on a call. It's that simple. And there's no policy to maintain. There's no configurations. There's no rules you've got to abide by. It's very much set and forget. But yeah, come see us at Booth 16. I'm not sure how we did on time. Hopefully, I gave you some time back. I did, I did mean to start this conversation out by saying I was super happy today to be here at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm not your 4 o'clock session, which puts me between you and the weekend. And the other concern I had a couple of days ago was that for you Astros fans out there, I might have been between you and going to the bar or watching the game somewhere else. So thank you for sticking around. And not putting me last. All right, guys. Appreciate it. The answer is yes, yes, and yes. It's, it's crazy that the tools that are out there to do it. Um, you know, back in the day, if you wanted to share something, you either saw it in the evening news or you waited for the paper. This guy right here, you can do something in New York City, and a, a millisecond later, you, you know, people all around the world see it for what it is. But it's kind of one of those things where, remember the, the ice bucket challenge? Imagine if we didn't have this, how many people would have actually done that? Almost nobody, right? But you, you teach somebody something, you show somebody in a way, and, and they, it just gets, I mean, it's just proliferates. It's, it's, yes, AI is absolutely being used to send these things. A again, it goes back to, I don't want to work any harder than I have to, so let me leverage some tools that are going to do it. But yes, good question. What, uh, what else we got? You guys seeing QR codes problems right now? I don't know how this happened. Um, they've been around a while, but for some reason it just took off. Like in the last month, almost every call that I'm on is, can you help me with QR code? And, and yes, we did. Because guess what? You take a picture with this, it renders a URL. If it's nefarious, we're going to block it. If it comes in an email, we're going to strip it out before the user can take a picture of it. But yeah, big, big, a big one. Um, trying to think of what else is, is big time. Yeah, question. QR codes out in the wild are becoming more and more malicious. Again, I, if, you take, if you take a picture of one, it's just informational, like it's the, the restaurant, here's the menu, there's a chance something got put on the phone that's watching what you're doing. Maybe is isn't going to try to steal anything, but it's a cookie. They want to know your browsing habits. They want to know what you do. They want to know where you eat. There's that. So you always had to be concerned about that. It's just not talked about a whole bunch. 
But now it literally is, can I infect the device? Can I maneuver over to the, the applications that matter and, and then begin to steal something? Yeah, we see it a lot. Yes, sir. I do it all the time. I, I, on my own LinkedIn page, I, I take it down very fast, but I'll demonstrate in front of a call. I'll put a, I'll do a, a rewrite of the URL on my own. I'll change it to something that looks like the org that I'm talking to, right? And I'll put their kind of domain, twist, name on it, whatever, and I'll click on it and it'll get blocked, right? It's, it, you know, based on what I'm showing, then I hurry up and I delete the thing from LinkedIn. But yeah, I do that all the time. They're there. They are there, and, you, and it's actually LinkedIn is probably the biggest threat to an organization when a user starts new and they publish the fact that they're starting with a company. Guess who's trying to contact them and pretending to be somebody that wants to welcome them to the company? Yeah, it's a big threat vector. Yeah. Yeah. What else we got? What what kind of threats are you all seeing? I mean, I mean, I don't mean to talk about necessarily malware, I mean, but what is it that's keeping people up at night? I'm hearing the phone is a problem. Um, I'm hearing that QR codes is a problem. I'm hearing that um, you know things are bypassing email security. You know, and what do we do? I think that's why Microsoft built the Graph API. They know by themselves they can't do it alone, so they have the space where you can attach advanced services that do somewhat of a better job. It picks up the slack, it augments what they do. But yeah, we hear email's a big problem, phone's a big problem. Um, one last one I'll tell you is that a, a company, I could tell you who it is, it's Mattel, because they, they've actually spoken to this publicly. But they had CrowdStrike at the endpoint, they had Palo Alto Networks as the firewall, they had abnormal security for BEC, they had, I'm missing something, Zscaler, and one other one. But nevertheless, you, you kind of think that you got it covered to a degree, you're doing the best that you can, but the CEO was in China. He was in China. But a bad actor knew he was in China, and so this imposter sent somebody on the finance team a WhatsApp message said, hey, I'm over here. Can you quickly assemble the, the finance executive team? Let's all jump on a team's meeting. I want to discuss the financials that we just spoke about. So sure enough, the finance team jumped on the team's meeting. And what they see is the CEO's face in the Zoom. And the imposter scraped the CEO's mugshot from a new spot that he did on TV. And he took the audio out. And so they're all on the thing and his mouth is moving and they're like, sir, you're on mute, you're on mute, you know? And he kills the video by design. And he said, and he started chatting. He said, I'm gonna make this real simple. I'm in China, the internet over here is horrible. I'm gonna make this real simple. Here's the SharePoint link that we use. Put the financials in there. And guess what the SharePoint link looked like? Mattel's. They became a customer they had a gap and it ended up being in the browser for them. They didn't have really any kind of browser protection, but they thought they had it covered, everything you know, around. But I can't you know, divulge how much money they lost, but it was a pretty penny. But the creativity of the bad actors and what they're doing today is, is insane. So anywhere a user can be messaged, they can be compromised, you gotta protect for all of it.